I will explain what a Pythagorean triple is later. So first, let me introduce you to two theorems I used to make my Pythagorean triple generator. The first theorem is the Pythagorean theorem. It states that in a right triangle, the sum of the squares of the two lengths equals the square of the hypotenuse, or a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b are the two lengths and c is the hypotenuse. So earlier, I mentioned that my program could generate a Pythagorean triple. Now let me explain to you what a Pythagorean triple is. So a Pythagorean triple are the three whole numbers corresponding to the sides of the right triangle. And these three numbers have to fulfill the Pythagorean theorem which means that the first number squared plus the second number squared equals the third number squared. So for example, three, four, five is a Pythagorean triple because three squared plus four squared equals five squared. The other theorem I used was the difference of squares theorem. It states that C squared minus B squared equals C plus B times C minus B, where C and B both can be any number. Now let me introduce you to my theorem and how it generates the three numbers of the Pythagorean triple. My theorem takes any odd number and notes it as A. Since A is odd, A squared is also odd. So A squared can be split into two numbers, C and B, which satisfy the sum of C and B is A squared, and C is one more than B. From the equations above, we can get that B equals A squared minus one, then divided by two through calculation, and C is just one more than that. In this way, A, B, and C make up a Pythagorean triple, which satisfies A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So for example, if we take the earlier Pythagorean triple I mentioned before, three, four, five, and you just input three, then my program takes the three, it squares it, so nine, then minus one, so eight, then divided by two is four. So then the second number is four and the third number is just one more than the second number. So the third number is five. And as you can see, my program works because it came up with three, four, five out of just three. Now, let me show you the actual proof that my theorem actually works. So as mentioned before, B equals A squared minus one, then divided by two. And C is just one more than that. So we can get C plus B equals A squared through calculation. And C is just one more than B. So using the difference of squares theorem I explained earlier, C squared minus B squared equals C plus B times C minus B. And since C minus B is one and C plus B is just A squared, then a squared times one is just a squared. So c squared minus b squared equals a squared. Therefore, my theorem satisfies the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared and works. So as you can see, this is the code I made to generate the Pythagorean triple. When you run the code, it says enter an odd positive integer greater than one over here in the bottom right corner. And so for example, let's say you enter three or not five, and then you press enter and it comes up with the Pythagorean triple five, 12, 13. Also, as you can see, I use some extra code to draw the triangle the right triangle over here. So it draws the right triangle over here.
So in conclusion, my program is helpful when you want to find a unique Pythagorean triple given any odd number. It also shows that there are infinitely many unique Pythagorean triples since my program generates one with only an odd number and there are infinitely many odd numbers. And thank you. Okay, that, that was great. Thank you for your presentation. And now it's time for the judges to ask you questions. Do I need to stop sharing? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, Ethan, hold on for a minute because the judge is not here. There was uh, two judges were here. Can you ask a judge if I'm able to shine and, uh, and uh, um, Ivy Max? Yeah, make sure double check judge is here. Because I see Shen, uh, Dr. Shen, and uh, Dr. Lukman is here. There are two judges missing. Okay, just hold on for a minute. Wait, so the other judges didn't hear my presentation? Um. Don't worry, William. Uh, if we have just two judges and the, only these two judges' scores will be counted. Uh, okay. But I like your presentation. It's very impressive. You made it very clear. Um, it's very interesting. And you're concluding that uh, there's an infinitive number of these unique uh, triangles. It's kind of really cool uh, concluding. So my question is for you. So what motivates you to do this uh, project? Well, what's your driver? What uh, inspired you to pursue this so, uh, proof um, and your theory? Uh, it's really cool. I like it. So, so one day I was doing a math competition problem and it had something related to the Pythagorean theorem. And I thought about it for a while of, about stuff that might help me do the problem. And then in the end, after thinking for a while, I found and I came up with this. So for this presentation, for this science fair, I just decided to share it because it was really cool. It is cool. Thank you, William. Uh, do other judges have questions? Judge Luckman? Yes, William. How did you first get interested in uh, geometry? Um, well, I I just, um, well, I, I like math. So I've competed in multiple math competitions before. And so I just happened to learn th these kind of geometry things like math skills and and as i said before uh, so one day i just thought about something related to the pythagorean theorem and then i just found this nice um and last question can you uh what are some practical applications of your program if you were asking so, so like um if you wanted to like find a pythagorean triple really fast then you would like only need an odd number to do it and also as i mentioned in the presentation it proves that there are infinitely many odd numbers i mean unique pythagorean triples since my program generates one with only an odd number and a unique Pythagorean triple is a Pythagorean triple that does not have the same ratio to another Pythagorean triple. For example, 6, 8, 10 is not a unique Pythagorean triple because 
it um, has a ratio similarly to three, four, five, because three times two equals six, four times two equals eight, and five times two equals 10. As you can see, the first one, all the, so the numbers of the Pythagorean triple, when you multiply them by the same number, they end up as the corresponding numbers to the other Pythagorean triple. So the other bigger Pythagorean triple is not a unique Pythagorean triple. Thank you, William. Okay, are there any more questions from the judges? Uh, no more, thank you. Thank you, William, well done. We may move on to the next one. Okay. So the next one we have, uh, make my book clean again from Maximilian He. Yeah, he said uh, the other judge, uh, Dr. Wei is here, just confirm. Yeah, just confirm another judge is here, just uh, Dr. Wei. Wait, uh, judge, please uh, your name, your name as judge. And so we will start the uh, next one, right? So do I start? Do I start? Yeah, if you have slides to share, please share. Max. Perfect. Thank you. Make my pool clean again. My motivation for this project is that last year during the pandemic, I had the fortune of swimming in a clear pool. But this year, the pool went out of control. No matter how much we brushed it or added chlorine, it wouldn't become clear. This indicated that it had a lot of algae in it. I want to help my dad figure out how to make our pool clean, like last year. I'll try putting pool water through a series of tests to see which one kills algae fastest. At the end of the experiment, I hope to have a deeper understanding of bases, acids, and how to kill algae. Algae facts. Algae belongs to the kingdom Protistum. It is an aquatic plant with no roots, stems, or leaves. It also is the number one oxygen producer. It produces more oxygen than trees. The design of my experiment. I had 11 samples divided into two groups, pH and temperature. I took pictures at um, zero hours, 17 hours, and 47 hours. So for the pH group, I had very acidic, mildly acidic, and then 7.2, which is the um, best, out, best pH for pool, mildly basic, very acidic, and then finally 2, 7.2 pH. They would all be next to the pool, but then the last two samples would have no sunlight, and then sample seven would have no air. For the temperature study group, I put them under different temperatures. Some were in the freezer, some were in the refrigerator, um, and then one was in hot water and one was on the living room table. The results of my study, the, they, all, they all look the same at zero hours, but then they start turning greener or less green the farther you get. My thoughts, an obstacle I faced. For sample seven, it was no sun and no air. The results weren't what I expected because I had residual air in the cup before I sealed it with plastic wrap. So I guess the algae still survived with the residual carbon dioxide and continue to grow. Something special about my project is that usually people kill algae with acid but I studied a wider range, including high temperature, low temperature, with and without air and extreme acid plus space. 
of conclusion. Algae grows less with sunlight. Algae likes heat. Algae doesn't like its extreme pH. And temperature doesn't affect algae. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, that was great. And now it's time for the judges to ask you questions. Thank you, Max. Uh, this is Professor Lane. Uh, thank you for sharing your uh, experiment and your insights. I learned, just learned from you that algae produce more uh, oxygen than all trees and plants combined. That's really important fact. i um, glad to know this. Um, so my question is, um, so you've done this experiment at home. So did you uh, eventually try this out in your pool or in a way uh, based on the conclusion? For example, it grows less with sunlight or um, more heat or extreme pH. And in particular, ex extreme pH, how, how would you make it work? Let's say you make your pool very acid. How do you eventually neutralize it and so you can swim in it. Um, so I couldn't really trust my project enough to actually try it on our pool. Uh -huh. So. But it's more of a, you know, so you, the purpose of your study is more of a figuring out the environment, uh, suitable environment for algae growth, right? Yeah. Gotcha, thanks. Well done. I really like it. Uh, you, you know, hands on, you, instead of relying on others readings, you do your own homework. This is really impressive. Are there any more questions from the judges? Yeah. So isn't it interesting uh, that algae likes heat, but yet it's uh, unaffected by temperature? Um. So for the hot sam sample in the temperature study, um, I forgot that the water would evaporate. Um, so the results aren't that clear. So later in the experiment, I had to cover it to keep it from evaporating more. So I don't think you can compare the hot one with the uh, samples outside next to the pool. Thank you. Uh, any more questions from the targets? No more, we may move on. Thank you. If we don't have any more questions, uh, please give your score and we can move on. Okay, uh, the next project is Biofuel Lighter by Lu Yao Ying. Um, sorry, um, so I- Jason, hold on for one minute. Can you make sure all the judge submit to the form? What? Uh, so I'm going to submit my form all at once because um, I have my own spreadsheet so I, I can compare horizontally before I submit. Okay, yeah, just make sure all the judge are yeah, well that, yeah, you can- Mm -hmm. Do that, or yeah, just make sure you finish. Then we can start next. Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, just a reminder that uh, for the first project, I think we're going to take the average score from all judges, right? So for the first uh, presentation, we we'll only have two, so you may take the two average, uh, the average out of two, right? Yes. And then now we have three, right? Good. Thank you. Now we have four actually. Okay. Uh, may I continue? 
Yeah, yes, you may, uh, Lu Yao. Do you have slides to share? Or it's just... Uh, uh, I just have like a little talking. Um, so, okay, sure, this, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Liu Yang. Um, and yeah, my project will be the biofuel lighter. And uh, this might be a bit embarrassing to admit, but this morning I was testing out my project and I found out that, actually, I'll first give an uh, introduction to my project. So basically it's a thing that runs on the basic principles of electrolysis. And I drew a schematic to show you what it's all about. And as you can see, um, I don't know if this is focused. Um, you can Good. see that it starts off with a little um, external electricity source. Um, and you can see these are the wires that runs into this little water tank. And as you know, electrolysis uh, separates this water into oxygen and hydrogen. So as you can see, there's I set a barrier right here to make sure that oxygen and hydrogen doesn't intermix. So oxygen goes at this tube and hydrogen goes into this tube through into this little tank. Um, this is where I'll store the hydrogen for uh, ignition and uh, this container was an idea given to me by my dad uh, who really helped me a lot throughout this project. So I give a lot of credit to him. Um, this container uh, is shaped like this and this blue stuff is water so that you can see when all the hydrogen enters in here, it floats to the top and displaces some of the water in there. So the water level rises up here. And when that does that, it puts pressure on the hydrogen so that I can go out through this tube. Um, and the hydrogen goes throughout this tube and into what I call the ignition tube throughout this opening. And here's a little piezoelectric device here that uh, combusts it with oxygen uh, producing a flame. And I also added a little hole in the ignition tube so that um, it provides enough stoichiometry so that it can light up. So I did build this project, but this morning I figured out that the electrolysis wasn't enough. So then I was testing it out and I put, okay, this was a very stupid decision for me to make. I stuck the wires into a wall circuit and then I, and the electrolysis uh, was more, um, frequent. And then what happened was that I thought that if you put the wires closer together, the electrolysis would be more um, frequent and more like at a higher rate. And I accidentally put them a bit too close and um, it kind of exploded, I guess. And yeah, my project was... Um, Oh, so uh, I should continue on. Um, I guess I just should give uh, some credits to my dad first because um, if it wasn't for him, I would probably be, wouldn't be in this competition because I would be probably recovering from a lot of a first degree burns <laughs> from hydrogen. Um, and also, uh, sorry, uh, also, um, What's really special about my project, I think I should add this because um, really what special was because uh, I actually got this idea from March or February and um, I uh, made this so that I was going, hold on, please. I need to tell my mom to uh, lower down her voice. Sorry about that. Um, so I was actually dedicated to this project because I was actually um, more of like a naturalist and I was really concerned about lighters uh, adding carbon dioxide into the environment. So I thought that if you we made like a biofuel lighter that doesn't release uh, carbon dioxide into the air it would be better for the environment. And uh, I didn't know about this competition of, until like June 14th, I think on like the first day of the kickoff. So I thought that, I was like, okay, I might as well do that. And yeah, I'm just still 
uh, dedicated to this project so that I'm planning to, after this interview, I'm still gonna work on it so that I can fix it back up again, make it running. Uh, are you done with your presentation? Uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention right. that. Um... Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, the judges came ask you questions now. I just want to say, Luyan, well done. Um, it's a pretty cool idea that uh, your lighter is biofueled, and uh, we are all very concerned about the environmental impacts these days. So I see this uh, project is very meaningful, and um, you put in work, do it on your own, you know, try it out, and you'll continue to work on it. It's a really cool idea. I, I like you have this diagram, right? You have the separation of uh you know uh two different gases and um it's, um it makes a lot of sense to me i think it's a really cool idea um uh, my uh question to you so what do you think eventually where we can eventually utilize uh ideas like yours uh where can we put uh biofuel uh lighters into use in our uh real life like i mean honestly if you could like literally replace them with any other lighter because um, like basically it's, it still works like a normal lighter. Uh, the only, there might be a few drawbacks and those drawbacks would be that um, you can't rotate it around or the water will kind of uh, get into the hydrogen tube. And another drawback is that the flame is invincible. So you kind of have to, unless there's like impurities in the air like sulfur or dust or sodium, it will have a bit of a tintish color. Mm -hmm. But if you know that the flame is there, you could take more safety uh, precautions. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, that was actually also going to be my question. I was going to ask you, are there any risks with uh, utilizing such a lighter and replacement of uh, a normal big or what have you? But you answered that. Thank you, Lou. Yeah. Thank you. Are there more in, are there more questions from the judges? Okay, if not, we can have a minute for the judges to give your score and we can move on after a minute. Okay, that was about a minute. Did uh, let's just get this one finish. I'm assuming. Uh, okay. Uh, so the next project is decoding letter from Elizabeth Jane, Ethan Leung, uh, Daniel and Danny Tree. Please start your presentation. We made a recording of, like we made a video recording of us. So should I just play that? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm.
Oh, and by the way, um, Elizabeth isn't here today. I'm right here. Yeah, I, I'm. Oh, okay. Cool. I'm currently in a hotel room, so it's, the Wi Fi is really okay. laggy. Um, wait, I'm going to share audio. Hi, I'm Elizabeth with the C++ group, and this video is brought to you by the C Monster Defense Initiative, which includes me, Daniel, and Ethan. Let's get to the backstory of our project. Noe sent a letter or audio message in coded language to her best friend Kate, who's traveling overseas. While the message is being sent, a sea monster gets a hold of it and adds his own noise to it. Uh, can you guys hear it? Kate, who's experienced in solving encrypted messages, knows how to untwist the letter. As said before, my name is Elizabeth, and as the team leader, I worked on setting up the meetings and getting in contact with the other team members. In addition to coding, I also played a key role in designing the team's slides and the logo you see in the bottom left corner. Hi, my name is Daniel. I worked on most of the preparation work, including generating the message and encrypting it. I also conducted tests for the code. Hi, I'm Ethan. I worked on the decoding and twisting of the message. We used a machine learning model, MLP, for this purpose. I trained the model and used it for decoding. Although it was easy to encrypt and twist the message, untwisting it was the hard part. The first challenge was that the twisting algorithm is unknown. During the untwisting part, we must assume that we are K and do not know the twisting algorithm. This makes it much harder to decode. What's worse, we don't know the noise. It's impossible to create some equation that satisfies all noises. The last challenge is that C++ isn't very efficient for solving machine learning problems. For example, Python has an MLP classifier class that can help train the model. On the other hand, C++ doesn't have a built-in class for this. I know, what is a linear regression model? Given many training examples with features x1 to xm and expected result y, find w0 to wm so that w0 plus w1 times x1 all the way to wm times xm is as close to y as possible for each example. The algorithm used is gradient descent, which involves defining an error function and trying to minimize it iteratively. Although we were getting closer to the solution, there were still a couple issues. For example, when we tried to use the weights to regenerate the original message, we were ending up with very wonky results. <clears throat> we also had to do some experimenting and fine tuning to get things right. Also, there was some dispute as to the indexing used to run the gradient descent. Finally, making the code work with an actual string message was also a bit tedious. As said before, the basis of our code was a five feature linear regression model. In our code, we used gradient descent to regenerate the optimal weights. We also tried experimenting with different ideas and strayed from the example our supervisor gave us. After a couple of weeks, we realized that we could change the initial value of the weights to get a better result. We also found an error in the error computation. And just like that, we were one step closer to achieving our goal. Now, Ethan's gonna show us a demo of the code we made. Okay, so this is the code we made, and I'm going to demo it as Elizabeth said. So suppose I enter a message, say, C Monster Defense Initiative. You can see here that the encrypted code is full of negative threes and negative ones and ones and threes. So this is um, the, basically the encrypted code, and then on the bottom here, you can see the twisted code. You can see that after adding the noise and twisting it, it looks very weird because, um, and there, and you can really tell that there is no pattern going with this. 
This is the untwisted code, and uh, and it's basically the encrypted code with one difference. The encrypted code has um four negative threes. We actually, the point of negative three is actually we don't need negative threes. We can use any number, but the point is that the first four, the first four numbers will be deleted in the untwist uh, through the untwisting process. You can see that from negative one, negative one, negative three and three. You can see here that it's the same for the first four and for the others too. In the end, we got the final message as CMOS Defense Initiative, which is what I entered here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was a really good presentation and uh, it's time for the judges to ask you questions. Well, I will go first. Um, it's a very impressive project. Um, we have three uh, middle school students working as a team and doing something really impressive uh, uh, with uh, programming, coding. And um, uh, I have a question. So, so you have this uh, decoding program. Uh, so, and I saw you guys uh, have something related to linear regression. So can any of you maybe explain to me what is a linear regression uh, is? Um, I guess I could explain it. So like oh. um, in general, like for example, if you had um, a line like y equals four x plus three, and mm -hmm. then you just add, and then to each y value added some sort of random noise, like mm -hmm. which is like random Gaussian distribution noise. Right. Um, um, then it wouldn't be a perfect line anymore. So you wouldn't be able to solve for the line. But um, by using a certain formulas, you can get that each y value is approximately 4x plus 3. Um, and that's basically what linear regression does. And uh, that's basically the um, this, like the, the center, I mean, the centerpiece of your program, right? You have um, a linear regression trying to back out the values, right? Given X, given Y, now you're trying to back out X, right? Is that what you guys are doing here? Well, yeah, like given the encrypted message um, mm -hmm. and you're also given the original message, you can like, I mean, given the twisted message and the original message, you can regenerate the, uh, you can find um, the weights that you can use to get the original message from the twisted message. And mm -hmm. then you can like apply that to any other twisted message. I see. And that's where the machine learning part comes in, right? So first you train your linear regression model and then you back it out, right? Uh, using the train the model you have, right? Yeah. Awesome. A very impressive uh, for a high uh, middle school uh, students, you can do this uh, project. It's very, very impressive. Uh, so one more question. Where do you see this program maybe applied uh, toward? Uh, I guess I can answer it. So, I mean, technically the problem already has an application, like someone sending another person a message. I guess that's really the main use of this code. And like, if you don't want people to see it, you can just give the person, like the person you're sending to the decrypting, like how to decrypt it. And then you can just send an encrypted message to them. And then nobody will know what you're, uh, what you're saying. But they may add like a noise as the sea monster did. Thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, plus one to Sean. I think this is a really awesome project um, from middle school level. Uh, one quick question is that uh, I want to understand more about the thinking process, how we settle down on the linear regression. Um, have we done some additional work to evaluating other models and how that will improve the performance?
um, I guess the reason that we picked a linear regression model was we sort of cheated because you know that um, when we wrote it, we made it so that the sea monsters twisting method is um, is a linear transformation. So like it takes like two values and then it does like 0 0.5 times the first one plus the second one. So you know that it's linear, so then you're going to use linear regression. But if you didn't know that, then I guess you just have to experiment around with a lot of different models and try to see which ones work. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, did you get to do this program all by yourself or you have a mentor helping you out? Uh, thank you. Yeah, like we had someone who um, he gave us like some basic Python code, but then apparently that Python code didn't work. So then we had to improve on it. And also like at that time, we didn't really understand any of this stuff. So we also had to learn about it. And yeah. Thank you. Are there more questions from the judges? Okay, uh, if not, we can uh, give a minute for the judges to give you a source. Okay, uh, that was about a minute and we can move on to our next project, which is also decoding letter by another group, uh, Elaine Xia, uh, Claire Tian and Kevin Yi. This is our CASPA Science Fair project presentation presented to you by Claire, Elaine, and Kevin. We're a group of seventh graders that go to the Harker School. Our project is called Sea Monster Twist, using machine learning to decipher messages. I believe that we'll present the story of our project next. We'll show an animation and then present our slides live. Um, here's our animation. In our story, Zoe sends an encrypted message to her best friend, Kate, who is traveling overseas. A malicious sea monster intercepts her letter, but is unable to read it. Infuriated, the sea monster adds his own twist to the letter, keeping Kate from accessing its contents as well. When the message reaches Kate, she has no way to see what it originally said. Fortunately, she had been in such a situation before and knew exactly what she needed to do to decode the letter. Kate uses data from the previous sea monster encounters from her overseas journeys to decode the message. Um, uh, this is our overview of the project illustrating the journey from start to finish. First, we have Zoe's letter. In this case, our sample message is, I love programming. In the second section, we have the translation of the message to ASCII code. Next, we have the sea monster's twist. And finally, we have the decoding process and the recovered letter. We first translate each letter of the message to ASCII code. For example, the letter I becomes 73. Then each character's ASCII value is converted to binary. And we grouped every two bits together such that the first pair 0, 1 becomes 1, the second pair, 0, 0 becomes 0, the third pair, 1, 0 becomes 2, and the final pair, 0, 1 becomes 1. The sea monster will twist each value of this formula, rendering the letter illegible. x1 and x2 are adjacent encoded symbols. The monster will half the first value, add the second, and add random noise. 
Now we will recover the original message from the twisted letter. We will use a filter to unwind the twist and remove the noise. Here's how the filter is applied, where each twisted symbol is multiplied with a set of weights. The first character is multiplied by W1, second by W2, and so on. We then sum the products to output M. Our objective is to find the correct value of the weights so that the filter rec reliably recovers the original message. Here we have a data set composed of original and twisted messages. We trained our weights on this data set using the machine learning technique gradient descent. Our weights are initialized as 00100. We compared our output M with the original message and adjusted the weights accordingly. The diagram on the left depicts how the weights change over time during training. W1 was initialized as zero, but converged to about 0 0.2. W2 was also initialized to zero and converged to negative 0 0.5. W3 was initialized at 1 and remained in place. W4 and 5 were initialized at 0 and stayed at 0. The diagram on the right displays the error between the original message and our decoded value M, which we were trying to minimize. Finally, we undo Zoe's encoding to arrive at the original message. To sum it up, we made a cartoon about our story and problem. Then we created a decoding model, model using Python to create a letter, encrypt it, twist it, and decode it. We've learned to use digital art and editing tools to create an animation, and machine learning techniques and Python to decode our twisted letter. Throughout this project, we also learned to work together and that teamwork is essential to complete any project. There were a few challenges we encountered while completing the project. The main one was working together during the pandemic. We used Zoom as our primary mode of communication to collaborate. In addition, it was challenging to adapt to unfamiliar editing and animation programs. We overcame these issues with some modification of our reporting layout and some testing. All in all, we had a good time using Python and creating our final project. We learned Python skills, machine learning techniques, editing, and other necessary tools for our presentation. Thank you. Well done. Have a great presentation. Uh, is there any questions on the attendance for this one? Um, thank you guys. Well done. Uh, very impressive, very uh, clear presentation. Um, obviously, the two projects are pretty similar uh, in the format. Uh, you want to cr uh, create an encrypted message and then you want to decode it. Um, so my question for your team is, what do you think your project, your way of doing uh, things are uh, better than the previous one, the previous project we just uh, had? Thank you. Um, one second, sorry. Uh, that's um, probably a question for ourselves, but uh, if you happen to be paying attention to the previous project. Uh, yeah. yeah, our motivation is a story resembling a fairy tale. So um, to create a problem, but they did that too. And um, um, our difference from them is that um, we, before, um, before we did this project, all of us had like no experience in um, programs like editing and animation because we used an animation at the beginning similar to the other team. And um, we had to um, put clips together to make the video and none of us had any experience. So we had to learn how to use new programs. And we, um, most of us also had little to no experience in Python, so we also had to learn about new functions and um, statements in Python to be able to create the code for this. Thank you for sharing your experience. Oh, and also, um, we, um, the spreadsheet that was seen in the presentation, we did that. We did most of the calculation by hand, except for the last successful decoding. Um, we used, we took the letter and then manually found the ASCII code by 
um, using a computer to like put in the number and find the ASCII code and then translated that to binary, made it symbols and encrypted and twisted it by hand, which was kind of painful and untwisted it after that. Um, it didn't work in the beginning, but with the um, trained decoding, it worked properly. Thank you, that's very impressive. That's a, that's a very comprehensive project. You have movie editing, uh, you know, uh, cartoons and uh, uh, Python programming and some computer work. It's very, very, very impressive. A good teamwork, I really like it. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, Which so I'm like, can I ask a question? I like, I think, I think like I didn't really hear you because you're kind of glitchy. Um, we could hear uh, the presentation pretty well. I... Uh, no, no, no. Like, like I can't hear what the judge just said. Like the other judge, what he said. Uh, you mean Miss Luckman? Yeah. Okay. Did... Oh, I said go ahead, ask your question. Oh, so um, so um, like, how did you guys happen to have the exact same idea as like the other group? Like, are you guys friends? So like, oh, did you like? We actually, we actually both like all of us go to the same school and also, um, like. We use the same idea, but they use C++ and we use Python. So like the same person um, created the idea and we both used it, I guess. Okay. William, very political question. Uh, uh, is there more questions? I think it's um, to William's question. I think there's a, a lot of um, projects out there that uh, have a, like a standard template. And you know, here are the challenges. How do you solve it? I think the two teams have the same challenge. That is, they code a message and then they decode it. Um, it. Just like you, when you do your, you know, mass computation, there's a standard sets of problems and they use everyone sees a different way of solve it, right? So we, uh, it's fine that we have similar projects uh, uh, on the same, but they definitely, they are doing their uh, methodology wise, uh, they're different, they put in their work. And uh, I think the most important part of, from a judge's point of view is what the work you've actually done, right? You've done, even though you may seem, hey, I did this manually trying to, uh, create a bunch of variants, but the, to judges, that's still good because you honestly did it, right? We want you to see how that experience, how that kind of work or frustrations. And to us, that you actually did it means a lot to us. And the same to your project that you, you know, you have a Python that was very impressive too. Oh, by the way. Um, the manual work was just to get an idea of our project. It wasn't, it wasn't the entire thing. We used Python, oh, sorry. But yeah, it was just to outline the idea and make sure our concept was correct. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And if there's no more question, uh, I think, we're ready to move on. Okay. So the next group is um, Project Go Bang by uh, Richard Wayne. Wait a second. Uh, 
I need to share. Let's see if, oh no. How do I, how do I share two tabs at the same time? Um, I think it goes like this and this. Okay, sure. Now go to, wait, so can I start now? Um, can anyone hear me? Oh yeah, yeah. okay, so let me start. Uh-oh, okay. So, hello, my name is Richard Wong, and today I'll be presenting my project GoBank, which I made in collaboration with my friend Michael Wu, who's not here today, so I'll present it myself. So let me briefly go over my project. As its name suggests, it's on the game GoBang, which if you don't know, is a game where two players alternately place black and white stones and the first to create five in a row wins. And I wrote my project in the language Python and I used the turtle library for graphics. So uh, how about uh, we watch the demo video that I made previously? Now, now I will start my project demo. Wait, can you hear that? We can't see the video. Oh no. Um I let's see. Um oh that that's bad. That's oh, kind of bad. I can see it now. Yeah. It's on the, the right hand side, right? The four main modules or five yeah. main drawboard, game client, and game. And you can hear it, right? Yeah, we can yeah. hear it. Okay, good. Main controls the entire game process. Drawboard starts and ends the game. Game client controls achievements, certain win and lose functions, as well as the timers, while game engine determines whether the game has ended or not. This is the Python console, and in it, important information will be printed. I'm putting it faster so that turtle it can go over interface, quickly. and uh, more quickly. the game will run in it. Now, this is the run button, and if we press it, then the game will start loading. And here's the loading screen, and let's see, what does it draw? It draws a yin-yang, as you can see. And then it starts to spin. At first, it doesn't spin really fast, but later on, it gets faster and faster. I think, I think this feature of mine is quite cool. So after it spins, it will explode. And now we find the start button. And if we press the start button, the game will start. Here you can see that each player has a timer. And if you place a piece by pressing on the board, it will become the other person's turn. The second player is white while the first player is back black. And since the second player has a disadvantage, he or she has more time. And if you press pieces, you can see it looks something like this. Now, the usual way of winning the game is if you uh, get a row of five. Either black or white gets a row of five. Now, there are some other buttons, for example, resign. And you can place Y or N here. I'm going to put N here, where it says that black was on the verge of resigning, but decided not to resign at the last moment. If you put Y in there, then black will lose and white will win. There's also the offer draw button, where you can also put Y or N. I'm going to put N as well, but if you put Y, then neither player will win and the result will be a draw. And there, as you can see here, there are also some achievements that you can make. These occur when you basically achieve something, either good or bad. It will cause you to gain this achievement and it will be printed in colored text. Now, let's see. Maybe white wins. What does that do? Ah, the turtle interface prints out the result of the game, and after 10 seconds, the game will end, as you can see here. Thank you. OK, so that was the demo video. And uh, let me try to full screen this thing. OK, here. So let me continue my slideshow. So now that we've watched the demo, let me briefly explain the structure of my project. It can be split into three parts, the initial setup, the game process, and the game termination. The initial setup has two parts and relies heavily on the turtle library. The loading screen, as you saw in the demo, was that spinning yin yang. And after it ends, there's the start button. And if you press it, you see the board and special controls. The start button also immediately starts the game process, which, which has the external interface, which is what you see on the board and the console. And, and in, in, like stuff will be printed in the console. And if you put stones on the board, then they will appear. And this is all controlled by the internal game algorithm, which for example, it make sure that you use illegal moves. I mean, you can't put stones on top of other ones, or you can't, and you also can't put them outside the board. That's just an illegal move. It also has those timers and achievements, etc., as you saw. And there's the game engine in the internal game algorithm, and it watches for not only legal moves, but also whether the game has ended or not. If if 
If it finds a win slash loss or a draw, then it reaches the game termination and it determines the end status. And that's where the result will be displayed. And after 10 seconds, the game quits, so the result disappears. So now I'll talk about some challenges I encountered, some problems I faced. So there is this thing of rows of more than five. As you can see, if Black plays optimally and places a stone here, then he or she wins with a row of six. In some versions of Gobing, this loses or it doesn't count as a win. You have to have exactly five. But in this version of my, my Gobing, this counts as a win. Now, at first, when I ran my project, this came out to be two wins printed in a row in the console. And why was that? Because the game engine detected a win two times. However, this is not supposed to be the case and it's tedious and annoying. So um, this corner case had to be fixed. So I ended up adding a variable to the game engine so it only counts the win once. Next, there was the extraneous pop-up window problem where here's an, a pop-up window as you can see here. So at first, there were no special action buttons in my Gobin project. Instead, every time you placed a piece, um, this kind of pop-up window would show up to ask for a special action. And counterintuitively, it's actually really easy to do in comparison with the um, later the special action buttons. However, it was really, really annoying. So we removed it and added the, the, the special action buttons. It took some work, but we managed to get it. And finally, there's the most difficult problem, threading library and game timer. So the game timer is uncontrolled by the threading library, which has independent threads. And even though usually uh, the threads end with the project, because they're independent, sometimes they just don't like to listen to what I tell them to do, and they just keep on going. And so we had to fix that problem, and it took a lot of work. We ended up uh, sidestepping that problem, so we fixed it. So thank you for your time listening to my project presentation. So any questions? Uh, very impressive, Richard. Uh, very good presentation to you. Uh, so how did you build this with just regular Python or did you build this with a Python game zero? Um, well, it was just regular Python, I think. We didn't, I didn't use Pygame or anything, but there was mm -hmm. the turtle library that was allowed in Reflet. I see. So what, what uh, inspired you to build this uh, game? Well, let me say uh, me and my friend Michael, as well as like a lot of other people, we all were in this, um, this class. Uh, a Zoom class on Python. And um, there was, at the end, there was this final project where we, we, uh, we, we were asked to do this Gobing. Now, Gobing is a fun project and I really liked it. And so uh, we, we did it. Um, so, so we needed to do this Gobing project. Uh, the requirements were that we just needed to make a Gobing, but since I really liked this, me and my friend, Michael, we decided to expand upon it and we added things like the achievements and like the special actions, et cetera, like, like you saw, as well as the timer. The timer was sort of difficult and we, and we did it. And so now, yeah, so we have this Gobing project. Thank you. I like the timer too. Do you like playing Gobang in, uh, on the board, Richard? Yeah. Nice. It has a, if you get into it, like there's a more official version called Renju and there are a lot of rules in it and some of the rules are weird. But I like the rules. Since otherwise Black has a, has like a total win with optimal play. I didn't include those rules in my game though. It's quite kind of more a casual version. Nice. Very well done. Thanks. Okay, are there any more questions from the judges? Okay, uh, if not, um, we're gonna give a second for the judges to give you scores. And now we can move on.
Richard, which school you go to, if you don't mind? Oh, I go to, well, okay, this is a bit complicated. For <laughs> the last uh, few years, I always went to a private school called Challenger School I, uh, uh, near my neighborhood. But this year, originally we planned to go, but at the last second, the COVID pandemic decided to increase unexpectedly, unfortunately. So um, at the end, we decided to temporarily stay out of school since last year they offered online, but this year they didn't. So now, um, basically, I'm just going to uh, go to a different online school. Thank you for sharing. OK. I I think we can move on to our next project. Uh, so we have using HTML to make web page of history of computer by Juliana Chai, Ivan Lin, and Google Chi. How Computer Work by Liniana Tai, Hugo Jin, and Ayman Lim. This product, this project is an animation of the Turing machine made with Python Turtle with an HTML page as a side. This project was made by Liniana Tai, Ivan Lim, and Hugo Jin. Um, my name is Liliana and I'm going to 7th grade and my experience is Python, Java, and HTML basics. My name is Hugo Jin. I'm going into 8th grade. My experience is um, Python, HTML, and JavaScript basics. Hello, my name is Ivan Lim. I'm going to seventh grade. My experience with coding is only with Python Turtle. How we got our idea? We chose this idea for a few reasons. The main reason we chose this idea was because it, it is a good balance between feasibility and difficulty. In other words, we wanted to do this project because it is not too hard, but it's also challenging enough. Originally, we brought up the idea of doing something about the history slash origins of the modern day computer after I watched a video about how math is incomplete, undecidable, and inconsistent, titled Math Have a Fatal Flaw by Veritasium. The history part was made into an HTML page, but it is not the main project. For the Python project, we decided to make an animation of a basic Turing machine with Python Turtle. The Turing machine functions by reading, rewriting, and moving along a strip of zeros and ones. Inside it, con inside it contains the instructions on what to do and an end for an output. The machine's instructions can also be copied onto other Turing machines. One struggle we faced was doing the HTML web page on the history of computers and how computers work to comply with our animation. Since we only had the basics in HTML, it was kind of hard to continue on with the web page. Um, and however, we took on a challenge by writing HTML, adding images, and organizing paragraphs. Overall, it was really interesting to try something new and learn about the different um, code in HTML. Another struggle we faced was in the Python animation, setting the position of things um, by using t.go2. We had to try many times before we got the position of the object correct on the screen. Uh, what we did was we created a web page for the history of computers and an animation using Python Turtle. For the history of computers, we made it so that it showed the timeline of computers and pictures of important people responsible for the concept of the Turing machine. The animation shows how the Turing machine works by drawing the stick figure which presents an image of the Turing machine. We use zeros and ones as input, wrote text for instructions to show the 
pr computer processing and an output. We had a lot of code including t.write for text, t.goto for the position. We also added colors and incorporate, incorporated much of the knowledge we in accumulated. On the left is a screenshot of the HDM web page we started on, and on the right is the Python animation. Um, this was a really good learning process. We expanded our knowledge on uh, computer history, and we had to experiment with a lot of functions in Python since we only knew the basics. Um, thank you for listening. Well done. You get to have a, a, a like a URL we can go visit by any chance. But it, it, it doesn't have to, it's not required, but if you have it. Yeah, just a second. I can also uh, share the code page. Yeah, just the link if you happen to have it. If it's, it's not required, if you don't have it, it's fine. It's really cool. There we go. Oh, the, the animations. Okay. Oh, I see. And you uh, post this animation in your website. Instruction loading. I have no other questions. It's just a very well done project. Uh, Judge Luckman and other judges, feel free to comment. Comment. Well done. Where, how did you guys learn HTML? What was that like? Um, actually, like some months ago or like years ago, I did like a touch on HTML. I just like went online and found it interesting as one of the coding languages and I just like kind of self-learned and I thought it was interesting to incorporate it into our project. Nice, very good job. Okay, are there any more questions from the charges? No more, thank you. Um, oh, we're gonna give a minute for the judges to give scores and then we can move on to the next one. Okay, so our next project is a text-based game for a moving cursor by Alan Lynn Williamson. Hi, my name is Alan Lynn. I'm, I'm going to seventh grade. And also uh, my coding experience uh, is in Scratch and Python. Hi, my name is William. I'm 11 years old and I'm going to sixth grade. My coding experience is also Scratch and Python, but I've only learned Python for this summer. This is our project, Monster Fighting Simulator. It's a game 
that where you are a character and you try to fight off the monsters and the monsters try to fight you. If you fight off the monsters, you can clear levels. And if you clear enough levels, then you beat the game. <laughs> we made this project using Python. It primarily uses text to display all the elements necessary to defeat monsters, gain items, and go through levels, although it also uses shapes. So as you can see, this is our code. It's actually pretty long for just text and shapes, but so every level, every level, there's a level item. For the first level, it's stone. For the second level, it's bread. So what you do with stone is you can make a stone sword then fight off the monsters and what you do with bread is you eat it and gain your hp back or health health points or your health in the game and as you can see when you run it hold on it's taking time um it's taking time to load. Okay, so when you run it, there are two options. You can start the game. As you can see, this the square is your character. You can move backwards, you can move forwards, you can move right, and you can move left. As you can see, these arrows are the zombies. They are chasing you and minusing your HP or health points down over here. So you can pick up the level item, which is stone. You can switch to stone in your inventory and you can use the, the stone to make a stone sword. Then you switch to the stone sword and hold on, all right, okay. So then you switch to the stone sword and you can fight off the monsters using the stone sword. So let me just get rid of all these monsters. You can see they're going away. So after you get rid of all the monsters, the second level starts. The second level item is bread. You can pick it up. You can switch to the bread. You can use it to gain your HP. And then you can switch back to the stone sword and defeat all the monsters. Mm. As you can see, these, these circles you can see are skeletons. They're different from zombies, but they're also monster that tries to attack you. So let me just get rid of all these monsters. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm getting rid of them. Hold on. <laughs> Let me just explain some of the fourth level first. So when the fourth level starts, there are these triangles that are mummies. And they, since they're covered in paper, what they turn around and if they see you, they go towards you. But if they don't, they go in a random direction. Let me just wait until the fourth level can start. Okay, see, it, it, so it prints level cleared when you beat a level. So let me switch back to um, the stone sword and let me use it to defeat the monsters. So the third level, since I already explained some of the fourth level, let me explain the third level now. These are the same monsters because every level, the monsters actually have higher levels, so they do more damage and are faster. 
So let me just get rid of all these. Wait, hold on. Okay, so let me just get rid of all these guys. What the? <laughs> um, okay. What was that noise? So, as you can see, my HP is lowering. As you can see here, and I'm trying to fight off these guys. Okay, so now let me wait for the fourth level to start. There's mummies, as I explained before. So yeah, these triangles are mummies. Let me just try to get rid of them. As you can see, they're kind of moving in random directions because they can't see me because of their paper in front of their eyes. And um, actually, so unfortunately, I lost since my HP or health points reached less than zero and it prints you lost and it ends the game. But if you were to beat level four, then you would win. In conclusion, our project is mainly entertainment as it is a game. But it also shows that a game with only text can be very complicated and fun. And also, just for fun, it, the game kind of simulates the current situation because of the monsters can be viewed as viruses and you can and you're fighting off the viruses. And when there's different monsters, it can be viewed as the different variants of COVID. So thank you for listening. Thank you, William. This is a real game. Um, I really like it. And I think it only takes a little bit of cosmetic uh, change. You know, you replace the square with, uh, uh, with the icon, you know, replace the monster uh, icon. It could be a very real game, but you don't have to do it. But I think it's, uh, it's a game that's working. It's really impressive. You and uh, Alan, um, sixth grader and seventh grader can do something like this. It's really, really advanced. Uh, very impressed. Um, it, you know, I would say you generation like yours is very are very talented. So like, um, so like, um, we actually spent like a lot of time on this, but like, so like, Alan. Alan has like more coding experience than me. So he did most of it while I helped him out on the code. And it, it didn't take that less time, but like, yeah. Very well done, thank you. Great game, William. Uh, is there any more questions from the judges? As there is not, we can uh, give a minute or so for judges to discourse.
Uh, if you're talking, you're muted, just so you know. Yeah, uh, we're just waiting for the judges to oh. finish their grading. Okay, that was about a minute, and we can move on to our last group, uh, which is the death of the splashing fire by Xi Bing Zhang, uh, Yi Xin Hu, Yi Tong Yang, and Ji Qiu. If you not if you don't speak, please mute. Okay. Um there we start. Hello everybody. In the next five minutes, I'm going to talk about these five, six, uh, seven following things. Our members, background, UAV introduction, process, how we start, teachers, and our expectation. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce all our members to you. Our team is made up of eight students and two teachers. Here are our photos, names, and our jobs. And I'm sure you'll see it clearly. All our members are especially in the negative. And then I'd like to explain the reason why we aspire to start this project. Forest fires, which take place in California, lead to an incredible amount of financial loss. And people can't get to know the one in the fires immediately. As a result, it is necessary for us to develop an AIA fireman to prevent the spread of the splashing fire from expanding into a big fire. But how can we solve the problems? Next, I'll show you our advanced equipment. Though the plane looks tiny and simple, it has many advantages for rescuing work. For instance, look at the red one. It can recognize different kinds of codes as well as colors and temperature. The ball is the main unit of it. And this is able to finish difficult tasks like looking for a certain location accurately. And after get ready for all the preparation, let me tell you how actually our system was born and how it works in real life events. Next, turn to our plan. Here are four simple steps throughout the process. Job a protocol. Program and job, test the UAV, simulate the whole pro system. Looking at the picture, it is showing the screen of our program. Looking at the chart, we can discover that it is a map showing part of California. The cartoon will be shown as well. At the beginning, we'll plan the route and then the plane starts cruising according to it. The UAVs are able to discover the bird of the forest fires automatically when they are overhauling California by their image recognition system. Next, they drop plenty of extinguishing bombs above the certain areas as soon as people promote them according to the instructions programmers have written before. Um, what's more? Sounds and lights will be released and planes will send reports to the fire station so that the firefighters can remind residents nearby or tourists traveling there about the danger they are in. Finally, all the related people are not unable to get prepared for escaping or in all. The plan will surely be highly feasible. After that, please enjoy the video which rec records our daily activities.
Well, in the middle is a whole process of our project. Firstly, we made a plan together. Secondly, we completed further discussion. After that, our leader handed out missions to for us to finish our own part. At last, everyone worked together and made sure the project is correct. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce all our um, teachers to you. The two gentlemen, our tutors, who has already achieved great success in their specific careers. Mr. Wong is responsible for organizing us and offering ideas. The other teacher is an intelligent teacher who is good at solving technological problems. To sum up, our project is still a simple scheme which aims to assist putting out forest fires all around the world. But during our experiments, we have found out that the battery couldn't last for a long time. However, I'm confident to say that our team has already made great progress during a short period of time. And hopefully we will collaborate to make it better. Thank you for watching. That is all for our whole project. Keep the fire away. Keep the war better. Thank you guys. Uh, this is a really cool uh, design. I thought that this is a game because you said the death of a fire. So I thought it was a game, but this is a real uh, challenge. Uh, contest that you guys want to use drone technology to solve the fire um, hazards we have here, especially in California. I really like it. And I see that you get to have a drone that can kind of, you know, uh, flew around by itself or without remote. That's kind of uh, cool. Um, so it's it's a really good idea. Um, it's uh, And I'm glad that you, you guys are looking into this. Uh, challenge we face. So I have a question for you guys. So um, so you talk about battery life, you talk about fire bombs, extinguishers. Um, so what do you think the likelihood that we can eventually deploy this? You know, what's a, how can we bring this to life? Say so we really have a fire and we have drones flying around. And uh, if we see the fire just started, it will you know, put it out right away before it gets too big. Uh, what, you know, do you get anything to share you know, how close this, uh, we eventually could have this in a meaningful, a more realistic way? Any, any ideas? Um, well, we haven't thought about it for further further study, but I can show you our program. And it's an app that provides us with lots of types of instructions and our programmers can change the parameter in the blanks. During the process, we are able to combine the distance, altitude, direction together in a certain period of time in a coordinate and then just need to start the program, which was written before. And in the real life events, some, some extinguishing bombs will just be dropped, off, dropped, dropped down um, when it gets to the certain places. And our planes will weigh a lot and it surely can, it can surely carry the, Extinguishing bombs. Thank you. Um, is, is this a scratch? It's it's a, the program you're showing is very much like Scratch, and it, it's linked to to the Jones, right? Program to the Jones. Is this Scratch, or what, what are you guys using there? Um, it is it is Scratch and Python. Python, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any more questions from the judges?
uh, if there is no question. Oh, yeah, by the way, the this group is from China and it was very impressive to do this presentation all in English and yeah. Uh, yeah, if there are no questions, uh, we can, this is the end of our event and the judges are gonna count up the scores and then uh, just make sure to attend the award session um, in about 20 minutes at 4.30. Yeah, at the main room. And I'm, I'm gonna send the Zoom link in the chat just to make sure you, you have access to that. Yeah, I believe that's the main room Zoom link. Just go there at 4.30 for award session.